Hey there, welcome back. It's Lara here with astrologymaven.com and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in Gemini that's happening on Thursday, June 10th. But before we get there, um, I just want to remind you that if you're not on my mailing list yet, then hop over to astrologymaven.com. The link is below and put your email in there. When you do that, you'll get my free guide to working with the moon. Um, and you'll get on my mailing list so that you know when my new website launches. And you'll not only know that, but you'll also be the first to know about some things that I have uh, in the works for you as well. So even if you were on my old mailing list before from my old website, um, if you still want to be on my mailing list and you haven't already done it, then go to astrologymaven.com because I, I think I said this last week, but... You know, I don't want to just assume, um, so I want to make sure that you want to be there. So if you if you want to, you know, keep up to date, then get on the list. Okay, so um, moving on here. We're going to talk first, as I normally do, about where the moon is at over the course of the week. So you can keep track of those energies and how they're kind of, you know, playing out in your own life on the day to day and also how you how you on a personal level kind of interact right with those energies so what do I mean by that well certain days lend well to certain better let's say lend better than others to certain sort of activities that sort of thing right um, and that depends on what sign the moon is in. So when you keep track of where the moon is at, not only can you kind of plan as best we can, right? I mean, certain things we can't control, but it's it's really, it's helpful to be mindful and to take note of that. Um, but you can also kind of get a sense of like, you know, I, I tend to, I'm going to give you myself as an example. Whenever the moon moves through Aries every month, because I have um, a bunch of planets in Aries in my eighth house, I find that I'm I'm more sort of emotionally irritated. And I see that pattern now. And I can kind of anticipate it. And I can take note. And I can go, oh, <laughs> Moon's going to be in Aries for the next couple of days. I need to, like, mind my temper. Or I need to, you know, just... Um, take note of if I'm feeling riled up, then I, I can discharge that in a healthier way than kind of, you know, going off on my kids or something like that. Um, so that that's what I'm talking about. So when you keep track of where the moon is at, and my free guide to working with the moon can help you do that, then um, it can be helpful to you, right? So the moon right now is in Gemini. And readying for this eclipse, this new moon, solar eclipse that we're having on Thursday, June 10th. Um, and then on Friday, she'll move into Cancer. So over the weekend until Sunday, when she moves into Leo, we have a Cancer moon, right? The moon is at home in Cancer. So that can feel, you know, homey, comfortable, familial, nurturing, um, all of those kinds of things. Then she'll move into Leo on Sunday, like I said, and Virgo next Tuesday. And one other thing I want to mention to you that's happening this week. I mean, you know, there's always multiple things happening and we're really going to focus on the eclipse, but we do have Mars changing signs on Friday. So um, right after that eclipse, Mars will move out of Cancer and where, you know, Mars is not, we've talked about this in past videos, Mars is not super comfortable in Cancer. And Mars will move into Leo, where um, the energy of Mars as the sort of yang principle of, of like drive, right, um, is, is a little more... Um, at peace, I guess. And it, that's a weird word for Mars, actually. But comfortable. It's more comfortable in, in Leo than it is in Cancer. Um, it doesn't have any special significance in Leo, meaning any any special um, 
dignity in Leo, but in Cancer, Mars is actually in its fall position, so not functioning well there. So, so that energy of Mars will will be out of the sort of emotional waters of Cancer and into the fire sign of Leo, right? Where it's a little more free to do Mars things. Um, so, so that's we're likely to feel that shift. Um, but the shift that's really, really at the forefront this week is that solar eclipse in Gemini. So let's talk about that. On Thursday, June 10th at 6.52 a.m., and that's Eastern time. That's Eastern time zone I'm using, so you can adjust accordingly for your time zone. Um, we have what's called an annular solar eclipse at 19 degrees Gemini. So between 19 and 20 degrees Gemini, right? And Gemini is a mutable air sign. So let's break this all down. First of all, I want you to know that the last, this is the last solar eclipse in Gemini. This is the last eclipse in Gemini period um, that we will have for um, nine years, but it's the last one on the North Node that we'll have for 18 years. And that's the way eclipse cycles work, right? Every 18 years, the eclipse cycles come back to, to the same place, the same sign, and in relation to the same node, whether it be the North Node or the South Node. In this case, we've got Gemini with the North Node. Nine years from now, we'll have Gemini with the South Node and Sagittarius with the North Node. And then 18 years from now, we'll have the same situation that we have now, which is Gemini, North Node, Sagittarius, South Node, right? Um, so if you look back to the years 2022 and 20, 2003, we had eclipses on the same axis. And in fact, on June 10th of 2002, we had a very, very, um, well, an eclipse at the same point in the sky at around 19 degrees of Gemini. Um, so if you look back to that time period, it can give you some clues about what, you know, what was going on for you, particularly in relation to the Gemini house themes, right, for you, that where Gemini sits in your chart. And we're going to get to that in a, in a few minutes. But, um, and you can see how that, um, that story of, of those themes that are related to that house that Gemini sits is being triggered again with these eclipses in Gemini. Um, and it's like, it's, in, it's really interesting to do that, you know, to, to look back. I, I know for me, um, very significant things were happening. I have Gemini in my 10th house, you know, of public life and career and legacy and authority and all of that. Um, and I actually was just graduating teacher's college and, uh, going through the process of, um, interviewing for jobs and I ended up landing a full-time teaching job. So that's what was going on for me. Um, so think back, you know, what was going on for you? And then in 2011, 2012, we had eclipses on the same axis, but opposite. So, the, um, Gemini was with the south node, right, rather than the north node. But it's this axis of Gemini Sagittarius that we've spoken about in the past that is being lit up during the eclipses on this axis, which happened twice a year. Every six months we have eclipses, right, usually in pairs. Sometimes they come in threes. And so um, this one is the last one for this season. And then in... Um, later in the year in, in December, we'll have, you know, the next and the final eclipse season um, of 2021. And that, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of us here, but that um, at that point, we will have an introduction to the next eclipse cycle and what the next 18 month eclipse story will be about. Because this current cycle will finish off in Sagittarius. There'll be an eclipse in Sagittarius in December, but um, there will also be an eclipse 
tweaking us to what's what's to come um, on the axis of Taurus and Scorpio, where the eclipses are moving to, um, you know, at the end of 2021 and, and more fully into 2022. But we'll talk about that more when we get there. You know, it's hotter than hell here today, so um, I'm going to be drinking my iced tea a lot, <laughs> maybe fanning myself a little. I have to keep the doors and windows closed when I'm recording so that, you know, you don't get all the background noise. And um, yeah, it's we don't have central air. It's pretty warm. Anyway, I shouldn't complain because uh, it's cold here most of the, the year, so I'll zip it now. Um, anyway, so what's an eclipse, right? Well... More specifically, in this case, what's a solar eclipse? A solar eclipse, all solar eclipses are new moons. But what differentiates an eclipse from a solar eclipse from a regular new moon is that it's within a certain number of degrees um, to the north node or to one of the nodes. In this case, we've got the north node. Um, and so in this particular eclipse that we're having, you may have heard me say the word annular earlier in the video. It's an annular solar eclipse, not an annual solar eclipse, which is what a lot of people hear <laughs> when you say that word, annular, meaning that um, it's not a full eclipse. So at an eclipse, right, the sun, the moon, and the earth are, are like aligned in a straight line. And the moon is in between the sun and, and the earth. Um, at a new moon eclipse and the moon covers the sun the light of the sun but at an annular eclipse we have this ring of fire around you know because because astronomically speaking we've got um the moon is a little farther away from earth so it doesn't cover the sun completely so there's this halo the ring of fire, right? You may have heard it referred to. And so it's not completely blocking out the light of the sun. So that's what's happening with this eclipse in Gemini. Um, and an eclipse, I've likened it to this in the past, and I'm going to use this example again. So think of it this way. You're, you know, in some room of your house, and the the power goes out or somebody like turns the light off and so you're in darkness right say the power goes out you're in darkness you you don't have any flashlight or anything like that handy and so you kind of have to like intuit your way right you sort of know where things are um and so you have to use your intuition and your your felt sense awareness kind of thing um, to to guide you and so an eclipse is kind of like that and it's it's sort of like this moment where the lights go out and like when they come back on things look different or um, you know we see things in a different way or maybe somebody rearranged the furniture <laughs> so things look different you know um, it's that kind of vibe that we're talking about here. So there's this sense of, of um, having to kind of, you know, trust our instincts in a sense. And the thing about it, like I said, is, is with an annular eclipse, the light of the sun is not completely blocked out. So it's like, um, tw like think of it twilight, you know? Things, there's some light, but, but there's a, this interesting quality where you know things may not be as they appear um sort of thing so you can think of it that way as well and you know just think about that imagery or or that symbolism of of the halo right and when we see that in um depictions like artistic depictions that kind of thing we, we often um, think about it in religious terms, but it's there in mythology and and, and that sort of, uh, you know, outside of what we might think of as, you know, 
traditional sort of uh, Christian terms or, or what, what have you. There's this symbolism of that that halo of light, that ring of light, and it conjures up this notion of something divine, right? Something that is um, special, important to take note of. And so that's what we've got going on here. And the really interesting thing about this eclipse is that, um, well, first of all, let me just backtrack a second here. What I want you to know is that although I said to you that, you know, look back to those eclipses around 2002, 2003, where we had a similar vibe going on, and particularly the one June 10th, 2002, um, which was an eclipse in Gemini at this, a solar eclipse at this same degree in Gemini. So very similar in terms of the themes, you know, that it's uh, highlighting for each of us and in general with the, the North Node in Gemini. But I looked at the eclipse chart for back then and there are some notable differences. Uh, in fact, that eclipse chart was quite, um, it, it was a bit jarring when I looked at it at first. I think actually, I just wanna take a quick look because um, I think I still have it open. And I don't have this to show you, but there is a big old opposition between all the planets in Gemini and Pluto, which is conjunct the um, south node in Sagittarius at the time of that eclipse. And we also had Saturn in Gemini with Mercury and the sun and the moon and the north node. So um, there's some some definite notable differences this eclipse chart this time around is a little easier looking it's more inspired it's um it's less sort of tense and ominous it's less less so that way um and so i want you to know that i'm just clicking back to my notes here so one of the things we have going on, and I actually do have the eclipse chart printed out for this eclipse that I'll show you. I think I forgot last week to show you the chart, but um, here we go, right? And so you can see down at the bottom where we've got all these planets in Gemini. We have the North Node. We have the Sun and the Moon conjunct each other at the time of the eclipse, right? Because this is a new moon eclipse. So it's when, it's just like a new moon when the Sun and the Moon come together to birth something new. But this time they are um conjunct or very close to the north node right uh, sometimes referred to as you know the nodes of destiny or fate um and then we have mercury there too sorry mercury is also very uh close to the sun within a degree so that's really significant and we're going to talk about that then we also have um jupiter of course at home in pisces and neptune here in pisces which is making a which is having a conversation with the eclipse as well that we'll talk about briefly. And then we've got Chiron and Saturn to take note of. Um, and you know, and I mentioned Mars is about to change signs, right? So you can see Mars, Mars is at 29 degrees of Cancer here in this chart and about to move into Leo the following day. So that's what's going on as far as the chart goes. And I'm gonna break that down for you. I wanna talk to you about the fact that Mercury is right close to the sun and the moon at the time of this eclipse. And it's significant on a number of levels. First of all, Mercury rules Gemini, right? So Mercury is in its home sign. So comfortable there, has the tools it needs to do its job. But Mercury is also retrograde, right? So, um, it's this time of reflection, reviewing, um, reimagining, you know, all those words that we use to talk about Mercury retro retrograde. Um, really paying attention to the details, maybe having to redo things. And around here, we've had our share of the standard Mercury retro um, things 
like technology breakdowns and, and glitches and communication stuff and all of that, right? And, and delays and that sort of thing has gone on most definitely. So, so Mercury's retrograde. Mercury's in its own sign. And Mercury is kind of like hosting this eclipse, if you will. And most notably, hosting the sun. And not only is it hosting the sun, but it's coming into this very uh, well exact meetup with the sun at the time of this eclipse. And we call that um, we call that Kazemi. So when Mercury moves into like the heart of the sun, there's a word for that. It's called Kazemi. And what happens is that Mercury, um, it's protected at the heart of the sun. Think of it like, you know, the king, you're under the protection of, of the king, right? Of, um, or the leader in some way of the, the solar figure you are, or the queen, you know, what, what have you, the ruler, you're under the pr protection. So Mercury is under the protection of the sun at the time of this eclipse. So there's a few different things about that. First of all, we may get this like window of clarity in the middle of the Mercury retrograde that we will, we might not otherwise expect. Um, but because of this Kazemi that's going on at the eclipse, it, it allows for that. And so the sun is, is in Mercury's house, right? So it's almost like I was thinking about this and I'm like, how can I explain this? And it, it's like, you know, the again, it's like the king is coming to dinner at Mercury's house or coming for, you know, coming for a stay at Mercury's house and um, is, is, is offering you something special, maybe some kind of divine inspiration um, or a fated, you know, event um, or a piece of key information that you really need to be able to move forward, right? So you can think of it like that. Um, it, it's, it's Mercury getting this having this face opportunity for this face-to-face -face meeting with the king. Um, and so, meaning the sun, the solar principle of, of um, you know, leadership. And um, it's like the central, the central, um, I think it was, I can't remember. I think it was Kelly Surtees I heard describing this or it was it might have been on the astrology podcast, but somebody was talking about the sun as the central organizing principle. I can't remember who it was. So apologies for that if I miss uh, <laughs> miscrediting there. But uh, and I thought and, or it might have been on the astrology podcast episode that was not that long ago about the sun. And I can't even remember. I'm ashamed to say who was on that one, but, um, it, it, it's, it's, it really struck me like the sun is the central organizing principle, right? You think about that. The sun is in a sense, it's, it's the heart of life on earth. If we, if the sun goes out, we're in big trouble, <laughs> right? So, um, we, we revolve around the sun and like life re literally revolves around the sun. Let's put it that way. Right. And so when, when we have Mercury um, meeting up with the sun, I just lost my train of thought, Mercury retrograde, Mercury square Neptune, <laughs> all the things, um, then it's like, there is something um, that's really lighting our lighting us up inside almost, um, you know, because we it's still it's an eclipse. We've got this 
this sense of having to kind of, like I said earlier, intuit our way, feel our way, right? But we have, it's like, you know, the king's given us a flashlight sort of thing, uh, as silly as that sounds. Um, so for some reason, when I was contemplating this, I was thinking about a book that I read a little while ago called A Secret History of Witches. And it's a novel written by um, uh, Louise Morgan. Louise, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it was a really good book. And um, it's about, you know, sort of a lineage of, of, of witches. And I don't want to give it away in case you read it, but <clears throat> this whole concept of kind of being taken under the protection of of you know the king or the queen um it really reminded me of that book and it may you know particularly because in that case when you're talking about um i mean we all know what happened to people who were um you know declared witches back in the day and so but if you had the protection of you know the 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 solar figure then you were okay kind of thing and so th this reminded me of that for for whatever reason um let's talk a little bit more about mercury here who's being a trickster with me right now and making me lose my train of thought and go off on tangents and all the things so mercury is in mythology, right, Mercury is the winged messenger. Mercury is the guide of souls. Mercury is the one who can move between the worlds. So, you know, Mer Mercury can go to the heavens um, and visit the gods. Mercury can, can be on earth with us mere mortals. Mercury can go to the underworld and, and guide souls, right? So, Mercury is able to mercury is a shapeshifter and mercury is this principle of of our our mind and if you think about that our minds can travel all over the map too right um sometimes that's an incredible thing and sometimes it trips us up you know our minds can be in the the present, but they are often in the past or in the future. Um, our minds can conceive of of things that you know have not been um, sort of manifested in our material world, um, our imagination. Right? Our minds can can take us to the highest heights, the heavens, and the, the deepest depths, right? Hell, the hell realms kind of thing. So it's interesting um, when you think about it like that, at least to me. So as Mercury meets the sun, this Kazemi that I was talking about, it's like there is a message that's shared with us that sort of has the potential to to change everything. Um, you know, we've got the sun, like I said, that solar organizing principle of, of life on earth, and it's protecting Mercury, it's offering Mercury wise counsel. And it, it's so, and the sun, who rules Leo, is, is like our heart. Just like life on earth can't, exist without the sun us and our physical bodies can't exist without you know a, a beating heart right and so mercury is the head the sun is the heart and when those two things come together when those two things are aligned we have this rich intelligence um when they're not in sync, right? We're kind of, we're out of alignment and we may feel like our heads are telling us to do one thing while our heart is saying something different. Um, and it can feel uncomfortable. It can literally like make us physically sick. Um, so I, it's like this moment of, of alignment 
almost with our with our you know the intelligence of our heart and the intelligence of our of our head um because so if this was a total solar eclipse and we didn't have that annular ring that ring of fire right that ring of light around the eclipse it might be more like we really have to trust our intuition and it's you know like get get um completely out of our out of our uh, head but it, it's it's not like that there is this this sort of balancing principle here that's going on so the other thing is because there's been so much there's so much activity in gemini mercury is there uh, retrograde in gemini there's a lot going on in the Gemini area of life and at the at the time of the eclipse it could be really amped up like it can feel like overwhelmed like too much information when we're talking about Gemini in particular right Gemini is the um the one who gathers and disseminates information Gemini is curious Gemini is like um you know goes around and, and and has the conversations and takes a little bit from here and a little bit from there and you know may change its perspective based on new information I, I wrote about this on Facebook this morning actually when I was having my coffee with the birds um and but there can just be like so much going on remember Gemini is one of the 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 signs um considered double bodied signs so it's the sign of the twins, right? It's a mutable sign. So it can be here and then it can be there. It can kind of be of two minds. It can be um, in two places at once in a sense, right? In our minds. So that can be going on at the time of this eclipse. And like we can be in like real multitasking mode sort of thing. Um, but we're reminded Mercury's retrograde take a step back, slow down, make sure you're getting the right information, you're asking the right questions, you are, um, you know, sh you are speaking in such a way or communicating in such a way that, that you're understood, right? Um, so there's this sense that Whatever is planted now, because this is ultimately a new moon, and that new moons, those are those are times of new beginnings. Whatever is planted now will kind of it, it may not be fully revealed until later. Um, so, for example, okay, I'm going to give you another example related to my own experience because that's what I know and it helps to put things in context for you. So again, working on my new website, right? And there's been so much, um, like so many little details to keep track of and, and to, um, to consider and to, you know, I'm tweaking and changing uh, things. I'm working on a course at the same time as doing this. I want to have that ready for when the website launches. Um, and so there's just all of this information to to weed through and decisions to make and things to consider. And um, so, you know, that's all going on. But the website and, and you know, what I've got going on here um, won't be revealed right away kind of thing so it's kind of like that um and there may be some kind of like i said some information some aha moment some some faded meeting or um piece of news um or inspired thought or idea that you have that is is kind of like oh there the light went on right and things look different um i got that p piece of information that i needed so that's that's the vibe here i would i would say that and you can i'm sure you're kind of getting this vibe from me right now things are very heady with all this gemini energy with mercury retrograde with you know 
an eclipse on the very uh, close horizon. And so it's important to try to bring yourself, you know, back down <laughs> to earth a little bit um, if you can. And, you know, whatever that looks like to you, whether it is time in nature, um, I plan to go to the lake over the weekend, um, probably right around, you know, the day of the eclipse. And that's always a very grounding place for me. And so, um, you know, whatever you can do to, to kind of help yourself with that. Um, what else do I want to tell you about this? Well, this eclipse is involving the North Node. Now, in certain astrological kind of um, circles, the, the nodes of the moon are considered our past South Node and future North Node. Um, where we've been and where we're going, what we're well experienced in and what we are, what our sort of soul is longing for more experience in, um, you know, in, in this incarnation. And when I first started learning about the nodes of the moon, that's how I learned about them. And that still makes a lot of sense to me in many, many ways. Um, so I, I think that that's an important thing to consider. But I also, um, you know, now know that ancient astrologers thought more of the nodes as principles of um, growth, north node, and diminishment, south node. So, you know, and in, in Vedic astrology, in Indian astrology, the north node is the head of the dragon. This, this sort of like, um, you know, with a voracious appetite. And the south node is the tail of the dragon where things are released um, or, you know, um, excreted, if you will. And so, but there's this concept, like in very simple terms of north node being associated with growth, the south node being associated with with diminishment right um and and so when i started looking at that more and in relation to my own nodal placement i um it made a lot of sense to me as well so the things in the gemini area of life for us can be f growing right now and what we need to caution you know, the word of caution I want to give you is that sometimes with with the North Node, it can be like an insatiable appetite, right? And so things just kind of go out of control. Um, and so we just have to be mindful of, of, of that and not kind of, you know, doing our best to not let that happen. There are some things um you know associated with eclipses that you know you, you'll often hear some astrologers say um it's a faded time and it does seem to be so that that it is is like this sort of karmic reset right um this karmic balancing in a sense can happen around eclipses and so we are not necessarily in the driver's seat we aren't necessarily driving the bus at the time of an eclipse so it's not the best time as you've heard me say before to um to necessarily do like a, a big new moon ritual or something like that it's more a time at an eclipse to kind of take a step back and to kind of be still and see what is offered up to you um you know and that may be to varying degrees, depending on how potently this eclipse is hitting your own chart. And we're going to talk about that shortly. So because it won't be an equal experience for everyone, right? Um, and so it's better to kind of just watch and wait and, um, 
you know, sometimes you do have to, you have to do your things, right? You have to live. Um, but but it, it's not necessarily like a time to 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 take on something um, completely completely new, or to you know launch launch into something that's completely new, um, as you might do at a at a sort of normal full moon or a normal new moon. So, and and the other thing I want to say about that in relation to, you know, not something that's completely new is this story <laughs> has been going on for a while. So the nodes have been in Gemini and Sagittarius for about the last year, um, for the last 12 months and will remain there <clears throat> um, throughout the rest of 2021, right? So this story began about a year ago. Um, like last May, June of 2020. And so if you think back to that time, you can think about what was kind of shifting and changing. And, you know, maybe there was the first inklings of something new on the horizon in, again, in the Gemini and Gemini's opposite sign Sagittarius, which will be opposite houses, right? Um, in those areas of life, like what was, what was starting around then? This is... A chapter in that story and because it's the last eclipse in Gemini it's kind of the last hurrah um, you know in the Gemini area of our chart in relation to this to these eclipse vibes for for years right like I was saying at the at the beginning of the video Um, okay, so there's a few other things that I want to mention to you in terms of what's happening. I, I kind of showed you on the chart, but what's happening in relation to this eclipse, aside from the really significant piece that uh, Mercury is retrograde in Gemini and Kazemi with the sun, right, that we talked about. We've also got a square with Neptune in Pisces. So we've got Neptune in Pisces uh, is at 23 degrees of Pisces and is making a square to... Mercury, the sun and the moon, it's, it's not super, super tight. Um, it's, you know, four degrees. So it's enough to be relevant. Um, and so it's like, um, you know, I don't want to go down a big rabbit hole here, but Neptune can have this quality of dissolving things. So it's like, and Neptune, you know, what we've talked about Neptune squaring Mercury before and how that can bring about some like fogginess confusion. Um, but also some, you know, Mercury Neptune combinations are very creative and, and, um, there may be, you know, um, they lend well to imagination, to poetry, to, you know, creativity, that kind of thing. But with the square here, it, it's like um, there may be some kind of like a disillusion of of what we thought we knew, Gemini, um, or of some, you know, some knowledge or some information or some idea um, or some message or way of thinking or some data or some, you know, perception that we held may be dissolving um, under this influence of Neptune, the square to Neptune. Um, so it might be like things are a little bit, you know, not quite clear, um, but we we will get that moment of clarity with the Mercury Kazemi. So just pay attention to what sort of comes in, right, for you that day. And then the other thing is, is we've got Saturn in a trine with the North Node. And so this is supporting us um supporting us in in gaining whatever it is that we're looking to gain in the gemini area of our chart where the north node is but also because it's saturn right boundaries and um rules and tradition and and uh and that kind of thing it is it's keeping us in check so i think it's sort of like we're less likely to go overboard, you know, that sense of going overboard with the North Node that's possible. Um, and we're, we're more likely like Saturn's there to kind of 
in a in a supportive way because it's a trine and a trine is a supportive conversation to kind of say whoa 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 that's that's enough that's you know you don't need to to you don't need more information you don't need um you know you don't need to take on something else um whatever it is so that's what's happening with saturn and then we have chiron in aries in a supportive conversation as well with the north node so in a sextile chiron and aries is sextile the north node in um gemini and so this to me is an opportunity to to heal who we are on some level right i i see chiron in, in aries as this opportunity um for healing our identity in some way and you know perhaps to claim more sovereignty in relation to the Gemini house, right? In our chart and whatever themes that speaks to for us as individuals. So that that's positive. And those are two really positive things. Um, and the Mercury Kazemi is another positive thing. And the fact that Jupiter is in Pisces, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's home sign at the time of this eclipse. Um, there's a lot of positive things going on at the time of this eclipse, more so than there were at the similar eclipse that happened back in 2002, 2003. So um, I'm going to take it. <laughs> I'm going to take it personally. And, you know, um, I hope that it works out well for all of us. Okay, a few other things I could say, but I think I'm going to leave that there. I've been kind of rambling on. And I just want to, before I go through the signs, I want to say to you that if you have placements around 19 degrees of Gemini or the other mutable signs, which are Sagittarius, Pisces, and Virgo, then you are likely to feel <clears throat> this eclipse more personally, more potently, um, because it will be in an, in an opposition or a square to whatever placements sit at around 19 degrees of the mutable signs, right? Particularly if you have, say, like, you know, if you have your, your ascendant, your rising sign, um, if your ascendant is around the 19 degree Gemini in particular mark, um, or, you know, your, your sun or your moon, or you've got a cluster of planets right around that area of the chart, give or take a few degrees on either side, then this is more personal for you. And you may feel this more personally and more potently. Um, I have, uh, for me personally, this eclipse is squaring my sun in Pisces within like two degrees. So, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I have a good sense of what of how this story has been playing out for me um, already, but um, I'm open to to some divine inspiration and uh, you know opportunity and and uh that kind of thing and, and and growth within reason as well okay so let's take it through the signs and we are going to we're speaking to um a rising sign first and foremost so if you know your rising sign then definitely listen for that first and also for your sun and your moon sign because those will give you some some good intel as well we're using whole sign houses here and so I'm taking it through the houses, essentially, right? Um, starting with the first house. So we're not going to start with Aries. I know everybody starts with Aries all the time. Sorry, Aries. <laughs> it's not the way we work things here. Um, I, I love you. I have lots of planets in Aries, but um, can't always be first, right? And so uh, the way I like to do it is I start with the first house and then go from there. So... In this case, and before I even say that, um, I want you in general, if you're if you're looking for some things to reflect on here in relation to this eclipse, um, just to distill down everything that I've already said, I want you to think about what has been going on for you over this last year in the Gemini area of your chart and how that plays off the Sagittarius era of your chart too, which is the opposite house, right? And I'll, I'll give you that quickly as we go through. Um, so what's been going on there? Where are you at with that? 
Um, what new thing is happening for you in relation to those themes? And, um, you know, look for that moment of, of clarity to come. And remember, we talked about this, this alignment between the head and the heart, right? Um, and it, it's, and having to kind of uh, sort of intuit our way. That's, you know, that's really kind of think about that and, and what that means for you in your particular situation and how you can kind of align your head and your heart, um, you know, and, and, and work with that. And um, what else do I want to say before I launch in? Um, okay. And I'm saying this to you for a few different reasons, but I just, again, to bring it sort of down to earth and give you a practical example. Um, so the, the last time we had an eclipse in, in Gemini that was similar to this, like I mentioned to you back in, um, 2002, and I told you that I had graduated teacher's college, was going through interviews, yada, yada, right? So, what happened back then is this series of events where I things kept changing. Um, and initially, I was like, oh, but that's not, you know, what I wanted to happen. But then something kind of better <laughs> would come in that I didn't see coming, all in relation to um, my, my, you know, the launch of my, my teaching career. And so it was like... <clears throat> I was offered, uh, first I was offered, I can't remember the exact series of events, but I was offered like a part-time contract and it was like, okay, you know, contract, most people get contract jobs. So they don't get hired full-time right away out of teacher's college. And then the contract turned to full-time um, before I had even started. Like this was all, this all happened over kind of a matter of like a week or two maximum. Um, and then I got a call the next day um, and I was being offered a permanent position, which was kind of, you know, unheard of. And so I was like, yes, you know, and fortunately, these two principals happened to be friends. And so one was OK <laughs> with, with that. Um, they couldn't really deny me a permanent position, but it was part time. And um, and my husband was between jobs all around this time as well which interestingly enough for him is kind of like in some ways a similar situation to what was going on back then as well but then um this uh, this part-time so I started out with this part-time permanent position and then within like a couple of weeks or so um I was offered a full-time permanent position and so it was kind of just this like, you know, all this was going on, but um, there was stuff kept coming in that I didn't anticipate. And it was like, oh, there's that and there's that, and there's that, right? So, um, and it ended up ultimately being like better than it started. So, um, and that was with, you know, those trickier kind of aspects going on at the time of that eclipse. So hopefully, um, you know, it works out as well or better <laughs> this time around. So, um, you know, just kind of think back what was going on for you. Um, how is this story similar? And don't be surprised, Gemini is a mutable sign, if things change, be adaptable, be open to, like be flexible in the situation that you're in and don't necessarily think that things are going to be set in stone. Um, you know, the first piece of information that you get may not be the last. Let's just put it that way. Okay. So now let's take it through the signs. We're going to, um, start at Gemini. I'm going to give you the house that this eclipse is happening in for you. So, 
what themes are being um, really stirred up with this eclipse. And you can also see how that's playing off the house opposite, which I'll, I'll give you as well. All right, so Gemini, for you, this is happening in your sign, obviously. So, you know, if you're a Gemini sun sign, um, that's, that's significant. If you're Gemini rising, it's happening in your first house. So your first house speaks to your, you know, yourself, your physical self, your physical vitality, um, your, your sort of general character, um, your sense of, um, who you are out in the world, you know, how you project yourself out into the world, kind of how the world sees you or perceives you. Um, these are all first house things. The first house is, you know, really this, this point where we come into the world and we are announced kind of thing, right? So, so it's significant to everything else. Um, so it's a big deal when things transpire in the first house. And so for you, it's this eclipse. So there is something changing here. Um, and this, again, you know, the story is not new. It's been going on for the last year or so. And you're reaching this point where something new um, is, is sparked at the time of this eclipse, um, a new trajectory you know, some sort of um, new way of perceiving things um, or, or, or even being out in the world. And so, you know, um, this can be things like, you are, um, there could be like a, a lot of changes going on just like for you physically that you're having to adapt to in some way. Um, a lot of information around that that you're having to kind of take in and weed through. And and um, it could be feel a little bit like information overload, um, you know, in that regard. Trust your trust. Remember, we talked about mar the marriage of the head and the heart, right? And, and, and you have to trust your sort of intuition. Um, but Gemini is also this sort of rational, logical air sign. And so there is a, an element of that. And, and you may get some kind of clarity um, or some kind of like inspired thought or idea um, or piece of information that comes in around the time of this eclipse. And keep in mind what I, I said, um, it just in terms of like, don't necessarily hang your hat on the very first thing that you're told or that you hear, um, because that may, that may change. Right. But there is some sense of sort of, um, divinely inspired shift that that's happening for you in relation to your very self. Um, and then it's also impacting um, themes around relationship because Sagittarius, right, the opposite sign of Gemini, and that's the axis these eclipses are happening on. We'll have an eclipse um, in Sagittarius in December of this year again, but is the house of relationship, of close personal relationship, of contracts and agreements as well. And so there's something shifting there. There's something going on, right, between the Sagittarius area of your life where the south node is, where there's that um, notion of release or diminishment or um, letting go, you know, putting things in the past. And then in the Gemini area, which is you, yourself, there's a there's a more of a um, an expansion going on there, right? Um, with with this happening, um, with Gemini being in your first house and the North Node, close to the North Node there. So, so that's what's going on for you, um, Gemini. And I'm going to move to Taurus now, where you have this eclipse in Gemini playing out in your second house of your personal resources, of your money, your time, your energy. Um, you know, your, like your personal finances, your personal it can have to do with your personal sort of belongings as well. Um, but it can have to do with 
like what you value and place worth on um, and your sense of sort of your sense of self-worth right so but it's very much it tends the second house tends to be very much a um you know a financial house along with the eighth house across across the sky and these eclipses have been playing out on that axis um it's also the axis of form which is the second house like the material concrete form of things and you know transformation in the eighth house um and so there's a story playing out here about resources in some way um and this gemini eclipse is an opportunity for something new coming in um something new coming your way in terms of your your personal finances so it might be a new might be an inspired idea for making you know more money it might be a new um job offer or it might be um some kind of um information that comes in that allows you to get a better handle on your your resources like um it could be like um a meeting with a financial planner that goes really well that helps you out um that allows you to realize you know things about your finances and how to manage them that you didn't know before um it it could be um something it could be like even uh you know some kind of material possession that you you come across that inspires you in some way i know that sounds weird but it's possible um or that even okay so say like um maybe you're like i don't know like you could be like cleaning out your space and you come across some things that you could sell and you like, you get more money than you might have anticipated for those things um you know because there might be a real treasure in there somebody else's treasure that you don't want anymore but somebody else really values it so they they give you more money than you had hoped for um something like that could go on but in general these eclipses are on the the you know this financial access for you your resources and other people's resources um and so that's the story that's been going on for the last year or so and um it's continuing to play out now but it, it's this is sort of the last piece of the puzzle um in that gemini area of the chart right and it doesn't mean that it's like going to be like one flash of something that's going to happen and then it's going to be over these things take time to to play out um but you know you you know for yourself personally when you look at your own life when i you know i speak to those second house themes that i just mentioned to you like you know what the story is so expect things to change be flexible um try not to get overwhelmed like we talked about and trust your your you know that the, the marriage or the alignment of your heart and your your head in this situation all right we're going to leave that for you taurus we're going to move to aries now i am overheating people <laughs> um aries the fire sign so and ironically getting like a hot flash right aries rules the head so um that's really funny so anyways we've got this eclipse happening in your third house aries and so that is a house that speaks to themes of your local environment um and the people in it so you know things like your siblings your neighbors your community members friends that feel like sort of siblings um peers this has to do with your um, sense of communication 
you know, communications um, on the day to day, your communication style, <clears throat> excuse me. Third house is, is busy, right? It's, it's where Gemini um, naturally sort of resides. It's, it's the, you know, it has an um, affinity with with Mercury. And so there's a lot of busyness that goes on in the third house. Um, so we see things like, you know, uh, like commerce, um, the buying and selling, like here, for example, where I am, we finally just found out that things are starting to open up a little bit as of Friday. So interesting, the eclipse is happening right on Thursday. And then on Friday, things are starting to open up and we will see more, more commerce, more people moving around the community, more exchange of goods and services. Um, you know, maybe more advertising, even on social media about things being open and, and all of that kind of thing. So that's very, that's very third house. Um, you know, so if you're involved in say some kind of like, uh, I don't know, service industry that's been closed for a while, there might be a lot of activity around that going on. Um, there's also a possibility of this having to do with like, um, teaching and learning on some level, usually of the, um, like the, the early years, uh, you know, level kind of thing. So elementary school, high school, um, learning the basics, that kind of thing. There could be something going on in relation to that for you. But this is the axis in general of communication, of ideas, of the mind, um, which is the ninth house across the sky, which is where Sagittarius sits, um, Aries. And so this is where these eclipses have been happening on this axis for you. So there can be a lot going on in relation to, um, you know, the things in the Sagittarius house, the ninth house is where the south node has been. So those things have been sort of um, diminishing, meaning, you know, perhaps being released or, or getting less. Um, and those are things like long distance travel as opposed to short distance travel, which is the third house, right? Which is where Gemini is. Um, teaching and learning of sort of like the higher minded variety um, beyond the basics, college, university, that kind of thing. Um, it is our, our, our high minded philosophies and big picture ideas. Um, it's foreign people in places as opposed to local, which is the third house. So the third house is where things are sort of growing and expanding with the North Node there in Gemini, right? So those things that I talked about, things that are sort of more local to you um, and the, you know, those those concepts of communication and, and um, you know, the people that you interact with on the day-to-day, -day, that sort of thing. Um, so this can look like maybe something coming back around from the past um, with new information or people coming back around with new information, you encountering somebody um, in your local kind of sphere that has a message for you um, or information for you or there's a conversation that takes place that may feel divinely inspired or enlightening in some way. Um, or there just may be a lot going on in that sphere of life. And, you know, it's part of a longer ongoing story that has been playing out on that axis for over the last year or so. Um, and it's not hard to imagine how things like travel have been impacted over the last year. Um, but this is sort of like, there's a turning point happening here at this eclipse. Um, something new is on offer, right? it is a, a solar eclipse. And so consider, if you're making decisions, that sort of thing, consider A, that things may change, stay flexible. And also, you know, what is your heart telling you? What is your head telling you? Where are those things aligned? Um, and that's the path forward. So, Again, not necessarily advisable to make any kind of sudden moves under an eclipse. It's more about a sit and, and, and see what comes in and respond accordingly. 
So um, I'm going to leave that there for you. Aries is going to move to Pisces now, where Pisces, you have this eclipse in Gemini playing out in your fourth house. And that is the house of home, family, roots, place of living, um, the parents. Oftentimes I think of it as like the mother's lineage, but in ancient astrology, it was is parents in general. Um, you know, familial lines kind of thing. Um, and, and then across the sky, you've got Sagittarius in your 10th house of your public life, your, um, your career, the legacy. I, I think of it as, you know, the legacy you wish to leave in the 10th house and the fourth house as being sort of like the legacy that, um, has been left to you in a sense. And so there's something going on on this axis over the course of these eclipses over the last year. There's a story playing out here um, that involves your public life and your private life, your career and your home. I mean, a lot of people have been working from home, <laughs> so there's been a lot going on there, right, over the last year or so. And maybe that speaks to your own experience, Pisces, in some way. Um, but this particular eclipse in Gemini in the fourth house is sort of like the last hurrah um, in this series of eclipses in that area of the chart. So there is something new. There's a there's a twist happening here. Something new uh, that's going to unfold or that is unfolding um, that is also part of, of the larger story of this, you know, last year in that area of home, family, place of living, uh, potentially real estate even, that kind of thing. And be mindful that things may change, be flexible, in other words, um, and be open to some sort of divine inspiration in whatever form that comes to you. And um, also, you know, look at what, what what would it mean to you in this situation to have your, your head and heart aligned, right? So think about that. Um, so this could be, I'll just give you a few practical examples here. There could be something going on. Like I already talked about the work from home thing. So this may be that, um, you know, part of the bigger story is you've been having to work from home over the last year with COVID. And there's been like, you know, trying to balance the home and work life when you've got, say, young kids at home and you're trying to work from home. That can be a bit of a nightmare. So that situation can be shifting now around the time of this eclipse. Um, and um, there can be, you know, a new arrangement that's unfolding. Um, it could also be like, It could be something like a, a career move or like the letting go of an old career and, and you may, which may result in a move or some kind of change of housing situation um, or, you know, Gemini in the fourth house, like there's a lot of activity. There's lots going on, particularly at the time of this eclipse, a lot to keep track of. So Try to keep your feet on the ground. Be flexible, like I said. Um, and yeah, like I can, e I can even see this being like um, there's a move going on and there's a lot of activity around that. Or like you have bought another residence and so maybe it's a property that you're going to um, rent out or maybe it's like someplace you know like a, a cottage or a camp so you're gonna have like two residences um it, you know it's a very Gemini thing and you ha you have to manage all that right um around you know the, around the time of this eclipse that kind of thing can be going on so a lot to keep track of there um but know that it's like once this shift happens that area of life will settle down ultimately we still have one more eclipse in sagittarius which is in your 10th house of career and public life that i talked about but that's in december and that's kind of like the closing out of the bigger picture story right that's been going on here all right 
Next we have Aquarius. Aquarius for you, this eclipse is happening in your fifth house. So this is speaking to things, uh, to themes rather, around children, around and and like all things around you know children, including pregnancy and and uh, um, your own children, children in your life. Um, fifth house is about what brings you pleasure, what sparks joy for you, how you have fun in life. So things like you know romance. Um, as opposed to kind of like committed partnership that's more seventh house but you know it's like the dating phase right romance um just what you do for fun hobbies um creative projects you know that that you do that light you up um how you kind of shine out in the world so that's fifth house and that is the area that this eclipse in gemini is lighting up for you so there's probably a lot going on in that area of life um, around this time. And it's probably related to, well, it is related to the larger story that's been going on over this past year um, that has to do with those fifth house themes and 11th house themes of friends, the group, um, your alliances, um, the people that can kind of um support you with your with your future and your your hopes and dreams and goals for the future right um so Sagittarius being in the 11th house for you um Scorpio that's where the south node's been so that's where there's been like a letting go a release a maybe um um a diminishment in some way of I mean, again, here we are in COVID. So probably, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot of hanging out in big groups. There may have been loss of friendships or, um, you know, shifts in alliances in some ways. Um, a letting go of kind of um, what you had thought your future was going to hold in some way and then a growth in this area of life that has to do with again children or um romance or you know what brings you pleasure um in life and so this eclipse in gemini is the last piece of that puzzle for a while now um and there's something there's a new A new normal uh, coming about, in, in a sense, um, in that fifth area, right? Like a, a shift is happening and be flexible as a fixed sign. That's not always easy for you, Aquarius, but be flexible, um, you know, open-minded about what this looks like. Um, understand that things may may change they may not everything may not be as it appears right now you may get you're likely to get new information or um, that kind of thing coming in and if things feel really busy you know do your best to, to kind of take a step back at the time of this eclipse and align your head and your heart as it relates to these fifth house themes right and 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 that will allow that sense of kind of divine inspiration. That will allow perhaps something to click so that you you really know kind of where you're headed in that area of life. So um, we're going to leave that there, Aquarius. And I'm going to move to Capricorn now where Capricorn, you have the eclipse in Gemini, the solar eclipse lighting up your sixth house. So... There's been a story playing out for you, Capricorn, over the last year or so that has to do with um, themes of health and wellness, of um, work, of um, you know potentially um, like loss in some way speaking to the 12th house here where Sagittarius is sitting for you um, or solitude, you know, um, 
places of of sort of confinement or or places that are kind of tucked away from the world or, or even privacy. Again, here we are in COVID times. Uh, there hasn't, you know, if you live in a house full of people and your kids have been home or what have you, there hasn't been a whole lot of that, right? But very much this axis of health is being triggered with these eclipses over the last year, Capricorn. And so um, there is, you know, this eclipse in Gemini is part of the larger story, but it is kind of like um the last the last piece in this shift that's been going on um and it may not like it's not necessarily going to all happen on the day of the eclipse right in and around those days things are amped up and then we see that kind of playing out over the the few months to come and the whole story kind of wraps up at the end of this year when we have the eclipse in Sagittarius, the last one in this in this cycle. And so, um, but things are kind of winding down there. And so there's this sense of um, if something's been going on in relation to your health, let's say, you may, there may be like a lot going on around the time of this eclipse, like appointments, uh, rescheduling, phone calls, um, information to weed through, um, you know, that kind of thing. And then, but, but there's an opportunity here for you to get some, some real insight, right? Like you may connect with the right healthcare provider who enlightens you on a problem you've been having for a long time. Um, and there's a new piece of information and it's a sense of, ah, something clicks, right? Um, or, and trust your, trust your intuition. Like if you're going through a process and, you know, you're being told one thing, but you're, you know, you're kind of, your heart is saying something else. Well, see how your heart and your head are speaking to each other. You know, what's logical? And then how do you feel about it? Um, and let those things work together. Um So, and and be be flexible and adaptable in this situation, and know that the first piece of information may not be the the last, so to speak. Um, might might not be the final word, you know. Um, There could be like uh, also with the North Node in the sixth house, something like the, you know, your daily work, like just the toil that you do on the day to day and your daily routine. There could be some kind of expansion that's gone on there with the North Node, growth and expansion. Um, and then conversely with the south node in in um, the 12th house there could be losses that have gone on there could be um less behind the scenes there could be less um interaction um on some level with even institutions that um we see as being kind of tucked away from the world you know, there's something or there's something shifting or changing or being released there. So things like, um, you know, hospitals or um, spiritual retreat centers or rehab facilities or prisons or things like that, right? Um, something kind of being let go of there. Like I said, like your, your opportunities for solitude, perhaps, or privacy um, can be being released. Even you know, your, your sort of inner, um, demons in a sense, or your bad habits, uh, could be being released in, in a sense, um, as far, as far as that goes as well in the 12th house. Oh boy. It's always a lot to say, um, when we're talking about and then certain houses and the 12th house is one of them. So definitely though, um, this is, your 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 routine your health and wellness 
your your sense of like work um in the sixth house that's that this eclipse is uh shifting for you so i gave you some examples already and i um i'll leave you with that can always say more always always but i'll leave with that if you have any you know questions or you want some clarity then put them in the comments below for sure and i am happy to address that for you Okay, so I will leave that for you, Capricorn. I'm going to move to Sagittarius now, where you've got the eclipse happening in your seventh house. So Sag, for you, this is on the axis of relationship, right? Um, you've got the south node in your seventh house and, um, you know, in your sign. If you're a Sag rising, it's in your seventh house. And you've got the north node in your first house of, of self. Seventh house is the house of the other. So there's something that's... this. this Eclipse story for you, Sagittarius, has largely been about relationships um, and potentially contracts and agreements as well. But your self versus the other or the others in your life in some way. And um, there's this sense that in the seventh house, which is the house of, you know, one to one relationships um, like marriage partners or or um, business partners or, um, you know, close, close connections and close contacts, um, and contracts and agreements and any partnership that revolves around like a contract in a sense, or rivals is also seventh house, right? So there's something going on here that has been going on for the last year or so. And, this eclipse in Gemini is a time where there's a shift there and and um, there may feel something like something faded may happen. You may meet somebody actually that kind of feels faded or you may, um, you know, a relationship may, may shift. Um, a one-to-one -one relationship may shift for you. You may get... Um, new information from somebody um, or be inspired by another person even um, you know something that kind of feels like like a divine connection or like a, a more kind of um, spiritual connection potentially but there is growth in your one-to-one -one relationships ultimately that the North Node has been bringing to you um, in some way, shape, or form. And that could just be like a lot more communication. This is Gemini we're talking about. Um, you know, I mean, look at it this way. Again, we've been um, sequestered at home and, and doing all the Zoom meetings and all the online learning and all of that kind of stuff. And so there's just, there's probably been a lot more of your conversations and connections that have happened with people that are, you know, close to you that are happening online. Um, so that kind of thing. And there's a, there can be like, um, at this time, there's a shift going on in some way. And we're going to see how this, this is sort of the last, um, piece of the puzzle in this particular story arc, um, that will continue to play out for the remainder of the year. But at this moment, we're getting some kind of like, a a new awareness, um, so this could be like, um, let me think of it this way. It could be something like, you know, uh, you're in a, you have a, a close friend who you suddenly find out um, something about, or you find out that person is, um, you know, perhaps uh, marriage material, for example, or somebody that is uh, interested in in a in more than a friendship commitment. Um, I don't know. That's just one example that comes to mind. It could be um, some kind of contract that is finally um, like a new contract that like past events have kind of all led to this moment in a sense. 
And then, you know, over in the first house, which is the house of, of you, of your personal vitality, um, your, your character, your being out and about in the world sort of thing, um, is the south node's been there so there's been some sort of release or letting go or diminishment like on in quite literal sense it may be that you um you know you've had like diminishing vitality physical vitality over the course of the last year or so um or diminishment in like literally itself like maybe you've lost a bunch of weight i don't know um you know i'm just like that's quite literal but sometimes these things play out quite literally um or there could be like also like a a loss of self in a sense um and some shifting and changing going on around that as well um you know it could be that you are you were single and now you know things are you're moving into a more committed relationship or something like that okay so that's a lot enough 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 <laughs> Sagittarius um I'm gonna leave that there for you I'm gonna go on to Scorpio now where we're gonna talk about the eclipse happening in your eighth house so Scorpio for you um these this eclipse story has been playing out on this financial axis for you um so the eighth house is like other people's money other people's resources things like taxes and insurance and debt and wills and bursaries and loans and mortgages um you know and also sort of like our intimate entanglements with other people and our psychological kind of um depths and you know wounding and and, and healing um and so there is the story is not new, but with the Gemini eclipse um, that we went into detail about in the introduction, this is the last piece of that story in that particular area of the chart for you, um, you know, and, and then we're, we're on to new horizons, so to speak. And so there's, there may be some new information that comes in around this time, some communication that comes in, um, an inspired idea, um, you know, a flash of insight um, relating to other people's money in some way. Um, like, it, you could get an investor for something. You could... Um, You can have to be weeding through a lot of communication and 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 that kind of thing because it is in Gemini that has to do with other people's money. I mean, you could be settling an estate right now or part somebody. Oop, my chair just dropped. Something um, you could be involved in something like that. You could um, um, there could be something around like you know a, a therapist or something like that that that's um there could be a lot of conversation where there's a it, it could feel like a lot but there could be a moment of clarity that comes about um there's this turning point in terms of your your intimate connections um and your entanglements with other people and your your relationship to other people's resources so um you know and this is not a new story like i said it's been playing out for about a year now but in that area of life that eighth house things have been growing with the north node there and expanding um and so I mean, this can, on the one hand, be things like, you know, like I said, investors are investing. On the other hand, it could be, be like your debt is expanding and hopefully that's not the case. But um, this could be a moment, like I said, of divine inspiration or of like a really um, important information or news coming in that shifts that in some way or um, um, like there's something culminating 
even though it's a new moon, we have to have endings before we can have beginnings, right? And there's there's these like new seeds being planted um, that we may not see come to fruition really until, you know, kind of six months from now or what have you. So in, in relation to that eighth house. And then for you, the second house is the other financial house, which is about your resources and the sort of the money you earn and make um, and your material possessions and your um, sense of self-worth and value, what you value. And so there's been something, it may have feel like there's a release there. There's a letting go. Um, there's a diminishment in some way. I mean, a lot of people have lost money, right? And earning power during COVID. Um, and so, but I kind of see like this particular eclipse as being a bit of a turning point in that story in some way. All right. So I'm going to leave that there, Scorpio. I can blather on for so long on all of these topics. Um, but I'm getting so overheated. All right. Leave that there, Scorpio. Moving on to Libra right now. So Libra, for you, this eclipse is happening in your ninth house of foreign people and places, long distance travel, your um, higher minded sort of ideals and, and um, philosophies and worldview, um, you know, higher learning, those sorts of things. So um, and this is opposing the third house, which is where Sagittarius sits for you, right? The other house, the eclipses have been happening in over the last year. And that is about your local environment, your local community and short distance travel and daily communications and, um, you know, learning the basics and teaching and learning of like, you know, elementary, um, high school level kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> commerce, marketing, those sorts of things. So with um, this eclipse in the ninth house, there is this something new coming about, but it's not new, new. It's part, it's a new piece to the ongoing story that's been playing out over this year on that axis of, you know, travel and um, learning that axis of the mind. Um, and so it's like there may be um, some new information that comes in um, that opens things up in that ninth house, you know, potential for travel or a shift in your um, ideology in some way or um, something revolving around higher learning. Um, so stay flexible, like let's bring it down to, to practical terms. If you are um, planning a trip, a longer distance trip, say, because it, it is the ninth house, know that the plans might change. Um, be flexible. Um, be logical, but also, you know, listen to your heart. Like we talked about that whole alignment of the head and the heart during this with the, with the Mercury Kazemi. Um, during this eclipse, there might be, you know, a sudden kind of aha moment about th about something. There's a definite turning point happening here. There is a planting of some seeds that may ultimately, um, you know, you, you may not ultimately see the fruits of that for another six months or so um but there's something new being planted right now um i'm just thinking what else i can say to you about that hmm There's, yeah, like, there's really a potential for, like, a new way of looking at the world. Um, 
but it, it, it's something that it, it's been unfolding over the course of this year. So I think that I'm going to leave that there for you, Libra. Um, if you have any comments or any questions and put them in the comments below, definitely. And I will, I'll address them for you. So I'm going to move to Virgo next and Virgo, this eclipse in Gemini is happening in your 10th house. So this has to do with your public reputation, um, your career, um, your standing, you know, your legacy, like the legacy you, you're hoping to leave, um, your relationship to authority, your own authority, authority figures. Um, and your, your aspirations, you know, so this is, this eclipse is going on in that house. And so there is, which is part of a longer story that's been playing out over the course of this year, involving your 10th house and your fourth house, right? Which is your fourth house is your roots, your family, your place of living, your home, um, your parents, your, you know, real estate, those kinds of things. And so there's been something or back and forth going on here. And ultimately with the south node in um, the fourth house, there's been a, a release, a letting go, a diminishment of some sort going on in relation to those fourth house themes. And then a, a growing of 10th house themes of career and, you know, all those things I already mentioned to you. Um, and there, there can be a lot going on in that, arena for you around the time of this eclipse so things get really amped up there's a lot of pieces a lot of a lot of plates in the air right or balls in the air um and it is a time where something new is is getting um fertilized sort of thing so there is um a, a, like a shift happening there is a turning point um and you will see you know you will kind of continue to see that grow um, over the next six months or so and we hit that final eclipse in this eclipse family which happens in Sagittarius um, in December whoops in December of this year um, so those are the life themes you're looking for in relation to this eclipse or your career your public persona your aspirations your your standing um, that kind of thing right and so um, you know what this is about Virgo because it's not a new thing. Um, so just understand that whatever is going on right now, be adaptable. Um, you know, you may not have the final word right now. Be open to, to things changing. But you may get some kind of like um, divine inspiration in relation to your career or your work. You may encounter somebody who um, has something to do with your shift in career or your your career standing or your um, your visibility out in the world in some way um, that you know somebody maybe takes a shine to you and allows you for. I don't know, a promotion or, or greater kind of public exposure if that's something that you're looking for. Um, there could be um, more of a recognition of your authority on some level um, as well. So, you know, I gave you the example earlier in the video. I'm a Virgo rising, so speaking to what's going on for me. And so if you listen to that, you'll have a sense of potentially what this looks like for you um, in, in some way. And it's really, um, a matter of, at the time of this eclipse, you know, taking in all the information, but not getting overwhelmed and ultimately trusting like what's going on in here, right? And that, that alignment of the head and the, and the heart um, is really important around this time. So I think that's enough um, for you to go on Virgo and I'm going to move on to Leo now. So Leo, for you, this is happening in your 11th house. This eclipse is happening in the arena of life that has to do with the group, your friends. Um, your alliances, um, the people that can help you reach your goals and 
you know, your networks, it can be online communities even. Um, and so, you know, different, different groups that you're associated with. Um, and so there's, there's, there's something going on here where there's a, there's been a story playing out over the course of this year that involves the 11th house of the group and the fifth house of the self, or this could be things like fifth house of children, 11th house of friends. Um, things could be going on as far as that goes. Um, fifth house of individual creativity, fourth house of collaborate or 11th house of collaboration. So, um, you know, and the fifth house is where things have been falling away or being decreased or being released or let go of um, because that's where Sagittarius, that's where the south node is right now, right? And and those are the south node eclipses that have been happening. We have the last one happening in December, which is like sort of the final chapter in this whole 18-month story. And then things are changing, growing um, in, in the 11th house of like we just said, the group, your friends, your alliances, your networks, um, that kind of thing. So, and that will continue to happen. And there's something going on right now in relation to that 11th house where it can feel quite busy and there's a lot and it could feel like a bit of overwhelm. Um, you know, don't make any sudden moves if you can avoid it right now. Just kind of sit back and see what comes. Um you could be inspired by some kind of group project. You could meet an ally or encounter an ally that gives you really important information, that gives you clarity in some way. Um, there could be clarity around a situation that's been going on with a group. Um, or your vision for the future in some way could happen. Um, but ultimately, the idea here is to be flexible and open-minded and know that like the first piece of information that you get is not necessarily going to be the last. Um, and also, you know, like we said in the introduction, things can feel quite heady and scattered. Um, around now so it's important to kind of tune in right feel your way tune into your heart that alignment between the head and the heart is the way to go here in this situation leo so okay i'm going to leave that there for you leo and we're going to move it on to last but not least in this situation um is cancer and cancer for you this eclipse is happening in your 12th house which is the axis right 12th and 6th house across the sky um of 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 health and the axis of um, sort of like your daily routine, which is the sixth house, and then the, the kind of things outside routine, which is the twelfth house. Um, it, it is the sense of order in the sixth house and a sense of chaos in the twelfth house. Um, the world that you kind of know on the day-to-day -day and your daily kind of tasks that you do and then the world that's a little bit more um elusive and outside of the the daily grind right so this is what's been going on the story has been playing out for you cancer for about the last 12 months now and we have this final eclipse in gemini in your 12th house which is bringing some kind of um final twist or shift um in relation to those themes of um, of your 12th house, which, you know, is, it can have to do with your, your health on a more kind of um, spiritual, mental level. Uh, it can have to do with, um, like, the... Uh, like a sense of, of, of letting go or things ending. Um, it can have to do with, like I said, anything that's sort of been outside of routine. Um, places of confinement could be involved in some way, which is 
hospitals, uh, you know, spiritual retreat centers, um, rehabilitation facilities, um, prisons, you know, lots of like anything you can think of along those lines where, where we're like, we have to stop our daily routine. Um, you know, it, it could be involved here. So, so that area of life has been expanding for you, um, for better or worse with the North node there in Gemini. And there could be a lot going on. Um, and, and so, and this can even be about like some bad habits we have or self-sabotaging behaviors that may be getting a little out of, out of control, right. With the North node there potentially. Um, but there is some good inspired, um, divine intervention, shall we say, uh, happening around the time of this eclipse in Gemini. And so there may be information that comes in either from one of these like institutions that I spoke about or in relation to that, or um, there may be a new relationship, you know, in some way with, with that area of, of life. Um, there could be a connection with somebody who offers you information, uh, and, you know, that can really help you shift things in that area of life. Um, be open-minded, be open to the possibilities, be, be flexible. Try not to get overwhelmed. If you, you know, take a step back, um, take care of your mental wellness and understand that this whatever shift happens right now in that area is kind of like the last big hurrah um in this overall story arc anyway and you know then we're going to have that final eclipse in Sagittarius at the end of this year which is kind of like the final culmination point of everything um and so that's where we're headed after after we have this eclipse in Gemini um, but whatever this story is just so as not to freak you out um, because you know the 12th house can have some some touchier kind of subject matter but it's you already know what's going on in, in on some level this is not a new story this is something that's been going on for the last year um, and you know it's it's ebbed and flowed and this is a sort of like a peak moment and a turning point at the time of this eclipse so I think that's all. Um, leave me your questions and comments below if you have them. And I really appreciate you spending this time with me. And I will catch you next week. All right. Bye for now. Take care.